All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXGS Weekly, episode number five. As you might know, if you read the chat on Twitter or you can hear by my voice, basically, I was a bit sick and I'm still a bit sick, but uh, not as dreadful as yesterday. So this is why the podcast essentially was postponed for a couple of days. And, um, you know, I'm still sick, but I thought, you know, what the hell, I can talk so we can do it because I'm I really want to want to do it. It's uh, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Uh, hey, Mikkel, how's it going? Welcome. Welcome, guys. Uh, welcome to the stream. So um, I already published the episode five notes on the GitHub as usual. You can find them there. Um, there is actually not too many articles this week uh, or was this week, I guess. Uh, last week. That's the correct way of putting it. Uh, but let's just go through them and see there are some that are really, really awesome and uh, that I really want to highlight. Uh, so let's just get started, shall we? So the first article is um, a bit on the silly side. It's called Here's what people in tech had to say about JavaScript when it debuted in 1995. And it contains a bunch of quotes from uh, basically quite important, like some important people, some not so much and some, you know, high uh, profile people in tech, um, and what they had to say about the JavaScript. So if you did not know um, about the origins of it, or if you did not know how the people look used to look at it, let's put it this way, it is very interesting to uh, see, you know, what kind of applications they saw in JavaScript back in and when it was just released, essentially, there are some really, really drastic changes in the perception and um, applications for it, essentially, yeah, Micromedia Shockwave being uh, like one of the greatest examples, I guess, for it, if you didn't know the uh, what is now Adobe Flash used to be Micromedia Shockwave. And those guys uh, planned to add JavaScript in there, but they ended up building their own action script, for example. So there's a lot of very interesting quotes. And you know, if you're interested in history and stuff like this, uh, definitely have a look because there is some really cool stuff in there uh, to be found out. So, yeah. All right, continuing. Um, this is not again strictly JavaScript related, but I think it's a pretty cool thing. So the Cloudflare just uh, launched their um, DNS that is called 1.1.1.1. It is fastest, privacy first, no log safe, consumer DNS. Um, of course, there's more than one already on the market, right? There's the Google DNS that is also claims to be privacy first, but hey, it's always good to have more players in this area and. Um, even though they, their DNS works pretty well, turned out that the internet was not exactly ready to IP address 111. So like the cool thing is that you can literally just go like HTTP 111, right? And you will get to the um, DNS with all the kind of all the information that you need to set up the, the stuff, right? Uh, they do provide this kind of uh, metrics here. Uh, for me, they perform more or less the same as Google's DNS. So I guess it would highly depend on where you are and what kind of, you know, the performance you get out of it. But uh, they do have the pretty good uh, examples of how to configure your iPhone, Android, Mac OS, Windows, whatever. And it might help you. It, it sometimes is significantly really faster than your provider DNS. So for example, uh, my provider and Vodafone here in Germany, they tend to break their own DNS a couple of times a, a month, I guess. So I've just set up my router to use this DNS and it works way better. Yeah. All right. Um, I, yeah, I don't think there is anything else to say here. I mean, they announced it on April 1st, which was like, yeah, what is that joke? No, that's not a joke. And they really got this IP address. But there is some funny stuff going on. There was already a couple more articles talking about it that um, apparently people used 111 as uh, like a fallover uh, IP address that they thought nobody would ever use. So their DNS get lots of garbage traffic that they now have to deal with essentially, which is kind of amusing, in my opinion. But yeah, all right, continuing, we got a very cool article from uh, guys at Google. So this is the Google developers website. Um, this is an article that describes using the Catalyst Chrome to server side rendering of JavaScript powered websites. So it's sort of a generic approach to rendering anything on server side using Puppeteer. Uh, I've already talked about Puppeteer and in a couple of videos on it. Um, so essentially, this is this is the whole code, right? Um, and um, it, it it allows you to do server side rendering with any framework, it doesn't have to be react, it doesn't have to be uh, angular or whatever, you know, it doesn't need a specific solution, it can just literally render the page and then send it back to the uh, engine. 
So obviously there are performance implications because Puppeteer is literally a Chrome running in the background, right? So it's pretty heavy. But if you need a very, um, I wouldn't call it low end solution, but a very straightforward solution, right? Without, um, for the frameworks that for example, don't have it, then this is a really cool write up on how you can do it using the Puppeteer engine. Uh, and again, it integrates with Express here, for example. So it's a pretty good write up as it usually comes from the Google guys. Right, continuing. Um, if you haven't heard about Spectrum, it's another messaging platform, or I guess forum slash community slash messaging platform around open source. Um, it has some very interesting features. And uh, it looked kind of promising, but you know, it didn't gain too much traction in the very beginning. I think there's now quite a lot of pretty big communities in there. Um, but uh, it's too early to say anyways, it usually happens with the, any social platforms. But the cool thing is that they are now open source. So you can go ahead and have a look at the source code, how it's built. And this announcement is, by the way, published on the Spectrum itself. So it's like we can uh, browse the Spectrum. <clears throat> I've subscribed to a bunch of topics like this in uh, Next.js. And, you know, the, the guys from the uh, site have all their uh, tools here, like package and, and you know, uh, Next.js and uh, whatnot, whatever they uh, now shall, whatever they, uh, whatever they publish, essentially, right? Doesn't seem to be too active, but um, I mean, it, it seems like an interesting take on the whole like communication platform, right? I'm not sure if it's going to work out or not, but we're going to see. All right, um, continuing, we got another article from Google guys. Um, it is about lazy longing of images and videos. It doesn't. So why I included it is because I haven't seen it before. It doesn't really add anything, you know, super interesting about it. So it's just a very, very good, very thorough write up on the topic. So if you ever need to do lazy loading of images or videos in your code, or if you needed to do it, but didn't know how to do it, or if you're looking for more sort of um, industry standard way, I guess, right, because the Google guys, they know their stuff. Um, this is a very thorough and a very good write up. So uh, or Again, maybe you need a refresher, right? Maybe you forgot how to do it. There you go. This is the article to read, definitely. Right, continuing, we got um, reinventing npmjs.com. Uh, last time I said that there was a re, um, not rebranding. Let me let me think for a second. What was the word um, redesign of npm website, right? We had a new fancy UI that looks very nice with like charts and everything. And uh, turns out they changed the text tag behind it. So and this blog is essentially a write up to why they changed from Happy and jQuery to uh, Spife and React. I, I'm not sure if I'm reading that correctly. So Spife or Spife? How, how do you? <laughs> is there an explanation of how to read that? Um, I'm just gonna read it as Spife. I, I guess Spife would be right because it's for um, spoon. No, it's not a spoon. Why is it? <laughs> that confuses me so much. Okay, um, scoops like a spoon. Why do you say a spoon, but you have a fork there? That confuses the hell. Okay, so it is a spoon and a knife, but they have a fork in, in a logo. Right, so I guess it's Spife. Uh, it's uh, like micro framework uh, for HTTP, right? So like um, micro or express or whatever. And uh, the article just goes through the decision um, making. How did they decide on React? How did they decide on the Spife? so on and so forth. Uh, it's not too in depth, but really interesting to read anyway. Uh, they also use the SSR rendering. Um, and uh, yeah, so some good stuff to see uh, from, you know, such a large, uh, yeah, it does make sense to read it as Spive, but man, that fork there is just confusing as hell. <laughs> All right, but yeah, so basically, yeah, if you're interested in looking at the insights of the large website like NPM picking the technologies, this is a pretty good article. Continuing, we got a building real time web applications using Vulkan kits. Uh, this is essentially a very, very, very thorough introduction to um, domain driven design, CQRS and event sourcing, and specifically the Vulkan kit framework that was built to build the apps like this. Um, as you can see, the article is very big, but it goes through literally everything you need to know about the whole topic, right? So if you never heard about domain driven design or about CQRS or about event sourcing, then this is definitely a place to start. So it has a very good write up on just about all of the parts here, including the again, um, first of all, starting from the very scratch and doing like, you know, what exactly CQRS is, how do you approach it? How do you do all of that? 
how do you build it yourself? And then it introduces the framework that essentially simplifies all of that stuff. So uh, if you're looking to get into it, and uh, it's a very powerful patterns to know actually. So if you are not uh, yet learned them, do make sure to read this article, you will learn a lot of very new cool things. Right, continuing, we got another incredible write up, it's called The Secret Life of Nan. Uh, Nan is of course not a number, right? Uh, and this is a very technical, very in depth, uh, right on about Nan boxing. Um, there is a quote here. Um, well, what is Nan boxing? So um, wait a second, where were, there was an explanation that was really simple. But uh, da -da 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 -da. where is it? Let me just find it and read it to you because hell if I remember how to correctly put it into words. Um, NAND boxing, yeah. Uh, yeah, there you go. Under NAND boxing, all values and in the language and their type tags are represented as 64 bits. So, um, and this goes into a look at the basically JavaScript core engine, which is why exactly is it JavaScript related um, and into how crazy people work with data, which is absolutely fascinating. So I won't go into depth, you know, and try to describe to you what exactly this article talks about, because I'm not sure I understood it myself after reading it like four times, I think I will need to read it a couple more times. But it is fascinating, nonetheless. So an absolutely, uh, like really well written article and very um, interesting to go through all of that. So I would love to see more stuff like this. All right, continuing, we got uh, announcing the second edition of refactoring. So if you are not familiar with Martin Fowler, he is a very smart software developer guy who is very famous for his um, amazing books and articles. So he has a whole website of, of ton of articles by him and his colleagues, and a ton of really good books on a variety of topics related to software engineering. He had a book on refactoring um, that was published quite some time ago and is considered to be like one of the best books in there. And the first one was written about Java. So why this announcement is interesting is because uh, for the second edition, he decided to take JavaScript instead of Java and um, make it web first as well. Yeah, so it's like there is some very interesting things happening here. And his decision of uh, using JavaScript, uh, as he says, was deeply ironic because uh, he's not a fan of JavaScript, right? And and he often, very often writes that he doesn't really like JavaScript for many awkward edge cases and some clunky idioms and stuff like this. And he complained about it in more than one place, even though, you know, he still writes it and, and does an amazing job in it. But um, he really likes the class model that was introduced in uh, ES6, right? And he thinks that combining that with uh, top level functions and using first fu uh, first class functions in common will make refactoring uh, like showing show will allow showing refactoring not only in terms of object oriented programming when you have like classes and hierarchies, but also refactoring out of the context of classes, which is I think pretty interesting. So I like literally in Java, you cannot do that, right? You have to use classes everywhere. So it's very interesting that he picked JavaScript for that though. So we're going to see how, how the book ends up. I'm looking really looking forward to reading that. All right, continuing, we got um, understanding JavaScript proxies by examining on change library. Um, I've already talked a bit about the JavaScript proxies when I showed the react easy state, right? Because it's built purely on those proxies. But I did not go into any details on how exactly they work and what they do. So here's your chance essentially to learn it, right? So it's a pretty good write up on what the proxies are, how they work uh, on the example of this on change library. Um, that is quite straightforward, actually, right? So it go just goes to uh, disassemble what the proxy is, how to use it, how to uh, tag the get handlers, and so on and so forth. So once again, if you're interested in learning proxies, and I would highly recommend to at least understand what they do if you still don't, this is a very good write up and a very good practical write up, let's put it this way and introduction to proxies themselves with some pretty good uh, references here as well. Okay, continuing, we got the comprehensive beginner's guide to JavaScript geolocation tracking. Um, it's essentially a use case demo, right? So the uh, the author takes the Google Maps and PubNub and uh, creates a map with real time device tracking. 
Um, the cool thing is that he does this in pure JavaScript. So it is, uh, it works essentially on all devices that support uh, location tracking API, which I think is by now everything basically. So, you know, if, if you don't have like, something super outdated, then it will work on your device. Uh, it is a very thorough write-up. So as you can see, the article is, is insanely huge. I will not go through all of it, uh, but it does include the source code and everything. So if you ever were interested in how the JavaScript uh, location API are working, do have a look at this. It is a very good introduction to it. All right, the next thing, uh, we have a lot of introductions this time around. So this is an article called ES6 Collections using map set, VIC map, and VIC set. So those are the ES6 uh, collections that has been recently added to JavaScript, if you didn't know, and they allow you to do some pretty cool stuff. And this article is essentially an introduction uh, that compares them to using basic objects and what are the downsides of the objects and what are the use cases for the specific collections and how to use them, right? So if you are again, not familiar with those collections, uh, it is a good introduction, uh, do have a read through it. It's not too big, but uh, gives you a solid understanding of what is going on essentially. Right, next article is, well, um, yeah, it's called Node.js ecosystem is a chaos. Um, the image basically says all you have to know, let me just sip a bit of a tea. And um, it's an article that basically discusses that some people in JavaScript community do some very weird things. Like the author says we still can code, but I wouldn't be so um, critical basically, right? Let's put it this way. I don't wanna put it so harshly, but I think that some people should reevaluate their decisions on using packages because package that is called is odd has around half a million downloads per day, which is like, why? So, and there's more examples here, like is number has also like some crazy download numbers per day and stuff like this. And uh, be responsible is a very good um, advice, I think. And you know, if you have, um, if you have, if you maintain a package, then uh, checking if you really need those billion dependencies uh, is a very good way to go. So please be responsible. That's basically all I have to say. Uh, do read the article though, there are some additional interesting facts here and there. Although, you know, it's mostly like um, bashing your responsibility, I guess, let's put it this way. But yeah, uh, worth reading for sure and worth following those advices too. All right, there we go. Um, the next article is native extensions for Node.js. Uh, something that I've slightly touched in when we built the crazy uh, Golang compiled extension that was called from Node.js, right? Uh, Golang shared library actually. But this is more of an introduction for the native extension using C++. So this is like literally, you know, JavaScript to C++. And uh, it goes to explain the what is NodeJib, what is NRP, Node on API, and so on and so forth. So it's a pretty good introduction that uh, basically um, introduces you to a very simple hello world uh, code. So in the C version, it literally just uh, exports the high string and that's it, right? So nothing uh, complicated about it, but it will give you an understanding of the sort of the skeleton that you need to have to build a native um, add-on for Node.js. All right, continuing, we got a quick guide to test-driven development in React.js, uh, which is also very big. So it's a very thorough guide and um, it does give, um, like it, it, it does a lot of things, including overview of a little, uh, let me try that again. Does a lot of things, including overview of available solutions and uh, basically showing what the author himself prefers, right? So there's like even a code sandbox stuff, um, examples uh, where you don't even need to install anything because it, it includes just basically, right? So yeah, uh, again, if you are looking to get into test driven development for React, or if you're looking for a refresher, or if you look for um, examples of how other people use it, then this is definitely a pretty good article to have a look at. Right, uh, I think this is our last article from the article section, not exactly an article. So this is an um, API cheat sheet from uh, Dr. Axel uh, Rauschma. Uh, and it's just a very good, very comprehensive, very easy to understand, uh, albeit a bit um, overloaded with types. So I personally don't really like the type notations. Although, you know, I do understand you need them sometimes. 
Um, but yeah, it basically gives you a very concise overview over the array methods. So and including the uh, versions of JavaScript that support those methods, which is also pretty cool. Right. And also the uh, signs that denotes mutability or immutability of the method, right? So like, for example, the uh, concat will not change the original array while copy within will. So yeah, um, you know, it's it's a really nice cheat sheet. And if you're uh, looking to learn methods for arrays better, then this is a really cool uh, way to do it. I'm in really interested in if he's gonna post more um, similar ones for other like for objects and for everything because th that seems like a very cool approach. Okay, we are done with the articles. Now we're coming to the releases section, which is actually really tiny this week. Uh, so the first release and I believe there's already one um, uh, like one minor or patch, I guess higher. So this is node 911. and I think is node 911. Um, not that many changes. I mean, it's a minor release. And there's just like some upgrades, some uh, small uh, event additions and an API supported bumps and stuff like this, obviously a billion of fixes and unit tests added as usual. Uh, but yeah, you know, nothing, nothing too major. So we're still waiting for Node.js 10, which should be released by the end of the April, I believe. So it's exciting times in front of us. All right, next uh, thing is actually quite huge. So we got sales 1.0 released. I've tried it a long, 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 long time ago. But as I'm not a huge fan of all in one frameworks, I uh, just never used it. But I know people who do use it and who enjoy it. And it is finally um, released as 1.0. And it is now like stable considered enterprise grade production ready, whatever. And uh, yeah, it seems like, you know, people are quite happy with um, all that it does, basically. So if you yes, okay, that's really interesting. I didn't see that before. So it's like Microsoft and Verizon are using it, which is pretty damn cool, actually. So yeah, if you're looking for all in one framework, then do give it a look. Uh, it seems to be pretty good. Right, next thing, my favorite editor, VS Code, uh, has released a March update, which bumped it to version 122. It's as usual, the change log is insanely large. I think my favorite change would be the syntax aware code folding. So it does no longer folds code in weird places and basically does it kind of in a smart way that is no longer breaking everything. Okay, um, there's also some additional cool things like the um, cross file errors that you can actually um, better see basically. Um, what is the what we did? Uh, yeah, no, oh, okay, they split it by editor. Ah, okay, but I won't go through all of that stuff because there's just too much. It's like every update is just incredible and they still deliver on, you know, insanely cool things. So there's even like ES, um, the conversion to ES6 now. So you don't have to rewrite your old ES5 code yourself, you don't even need a special tool for that. You can just say, hey, convert this to ES6, and you'll get a class out of the uh, constructor function, which is bloody amazing, if you ask me. Okay, um, last release we have today is webpack 450, which has been released with primarily, I believe it was the performance improvements, um, there is like yeah, improved readability of error messages, and some bug fixes. And uh, yeah, no, not like it's a minor release again, nothing super fancy here, but it's just uh, really cool to see, you know, Webpack developing further. I'm really curious, what will um, what will happen in version five? So what kind of things do they have in a, in a pipeline for it? All right, that's it for releases. Uh, let's go have a look at the libraries. Um, so that this is actually I think the lot maybe it is even larger than the articles we have. But uh, let's see. So the first library is uh, called nothing. And it is literally nothing. It's a chainable callable mock object that always return itself. And um, you can you know, you import nothing from uh, nothing mock uh, package, and then you can now uh, set it to object, for example, and then you can literally call whatever you want. And you always get the same nothing objects in return, which could be quite handy for checking uh, like functions, right? That like with null checks or whatnot. Um, it also can be handy for um, Where's that? There was some other good examples. Yeah, that's like the helper function. Oh, they even have like helper functions. 
and they allow you to filter out nothing. Uh, that is pretty cool. Okay, so but yeah, it's essentially it's a testing library, right? So you can. It even it even supports addition. That, okay, that is. <laughs> I haven't checked that part, but that's really cool. Um, essentially, if you're looking for a mock uh, object that you want to use in tests, that seems like a no-brainer. It seems to be very cool. Um, and it seems to be also based on ES6 proxies, which is quite awesome. Okay, so we got nothing. Yes, uh, next we got Flamebearer. Um, it is a flame graph tool for Node and V8 engine. So you, if you didn't know, you can export flame graphs um, to see, the, uh, to an analyze the performance of your app, right? And uh, here's an example graph. And uh, typically, if those graphs are really large, it can be very hard to visualize them uh, performance wise. So Flamebearer basically tackles that and uh, allows you to do it really fast and explore the results and, and go in because you know, those graphs are huge, like I, I, I went inside and this is like, you know, four clicks and hi, hell I know if, if there's more, I mean, there's probably even more depth in here, I'm just clicking the wrong thing, right? So <coughs> mm, yeah. I uh, apologize. So yeah, it's a really cool tool. And if you are debugging stuff, and if you are looking into the um, performance improvements for your app, then this is definitely a really neat tool to use uh, from the Mapbox guys, by the way, they do a lot of really neat open source JavaScript things. All right. Next thing we have is IPT interactive pipe Two, uh, Node.js command line interactive workflow tooling. So the idea is very simple you can uh, take something from the command line and pipe it into IPT, which will then uh, present you with something to do. For example, here, uh, um, if you pipe a less into it, you will actually be presented with a list of um, things that was, uh, how do you explain it? If you pipe the LS into IPT, you will be presented with an interactable list of files, right? So this is what the LS outputs. And it looks like it's really highly configurable, and you can do some crazy things with it. So I'm thinking I'm probably gonna um, use it in a couple of my aliases in Z shell. So like this looks like a very nice um, little shortcut, you know, you can basically list all the branches and then uh, pipe them into IPT and allow user to select the branch and then you check out that branch, which is, I mean, it's, it's really great. Like this is some of those are really cool. And I really like that. So we're gonna Yeah, basically, if you're a command line junkie, then this is for you. Right, uh, next is not as much as a lib is a collection of optimizations from uh, Google Chrome guys, um, for Webpack, specifically, if you are building a library using the Webpack, right. So there's a bunch of different things that can help you make it smaller, faster and better. So um, if you are building a library, and if you're using Webpack, do have a look at it, there is some very cool and interesting things in here. Right, next thing is Gron uh, makes uh, the tool that makes JSON grabbable and uh, grabbable not in a you know, grab way, the stupid way, but grabbable in a JSON way. So you can actually you know, you can get the JSON and then you can use F grab to um, actually look for properties. So which is kind of amazing. And then you also have this ungrown thing, which allows you to expand the full JSON, which is also kind of amazing. So uh, yeah, definitely, you know, if you're working a lot with JSON, then uh, do have a look. Actually, it seems like it's a very stupid way of working. So it basically just streamlines the whole structure, which literally allows you to use grep, which is kind of brilliant when you think about it. <laughs> All right, um, next thing we have is a password with a zero instead of O here. And it's a tiny uh, command line utility that allows you to check your password against uh, breaches. Um, if you are not familiar, there is a pound passwords from Troy Hunt and uh, have I been pounds API. Um, so okay, there's, there's two things, right? There's this first service that is called have I been pound. It's an amazing service and you should enter your email there and you should subscribe to it. Uh, it will notify you whenever your email has been in a breach. So uh, Troy Hunt essentially buys those breaches on dark web or whatever, you know, whenever they are sold on, on uh, the hacking websites, and then uploads them for everyone to test their email against. And if your uh, account is in one of those breaches, you will get an email saying, hey, you know, maybe you want to change your password on that service because it's been in one of the breaches. 
which is really cool. And additionally, he created the pound passwords uh, API that allow you to safely check your passwords and if it's been used already in one of those breaches, because if it has, that means <coughs> apologies, uh, because if it has, it means that people can just take that password, uh, take the breach database, right, the passwords database, and use the pre calculated hashed versions to just check against your hash and crack you in second, right? So this is not very nice. And this tool allows you to actually check the passwords against that API, I believe it works both in node and in browser, which is really nice, you can use it on your website, for example, to <coughs> Oh, God, sorry. Um, you can use it. I know that there's already been a few companies that used it on a website, the API itself, I mean, and said, you know, like, hey, maybe you don't want to use that password because it's been in the breaches. Um, and as you can see here, it doesn't use the password, it actually used the SHA1 of the password to um, check if the password was breached. So you don't actually send your password over network, which is always nice. <laughs> All right, next thing we have is a whistle. It's an HTTP, HTTPS and WebSocket debugging proxy. And um, it's basically cross platform, it allows you to debug any apps. <coughs> yeah, sorry. And works in a pretty simple way. Uh, it's like, yeah, the features seem to be pretty uh, extensive from like pattern matching to operator URIs and, um, you know, all those crazy things happening. So you can configure it pretty flexibly. All you need to install is essentially Node.js and uh, then you just specify the whistle in the proxy settings for whatever the app you're using and you're done, right? And, and it even has a web UI, which is very, very neat. So if you're looking for stuff like this, do have a look. All right, now we, now we have the Glide, which is a very fancy looking, um, how do you call it? The carousel API, uh, carousel thing, right? So this is a dependency free, uh, pure JavaScript slider. So exactly this thing that you see in the background. <coughs> oh God. All right, I think we should end this quickly because I'm starting to get cranky. Uh, but yeah, it looks very nice and uh, very lightweight, very small dependency free, as I said already, so pretty cool. Next thing is case X or case X, I'm not sure how to read that properly. Uh, it's a library for working with um, casing. <coughs> oh God. All right. <clears throat> and uh, the core idea is that you can uh, change the case of your words to um, anything like uh, uppercase, lowercase, snake case, spinal case, camel case. <coughs> okay. <clears throat> um, good thing about it is that you don't need to drag, say, Lodash if you just need the casing, right? You can use this smaller library and just use it. Um, continuing, we got a disk DB. I thought this was really cool. So it's essentially a very lightweight disk based JSON database uh, with a MongoDB like API, uh, which is the cool bit. So there's a lot of uh, databases that work on uh, JSON files on disk, right? But this one has a very similar to <coughs> API that is very similar to MongoDB, which is really, really cool. And I quite like the querying and updating functionalities in here. So do have a look at it if you're looking for one. Okay, next one is, I uh, already talked about a similar library from the same guy, Ken C. Dodds. Um, he did the React testing library last week, right? Uh, well, now he released the DOM testing library, which is essentially the same, but works with any DOM. So it doesn't care about React. You can rather give in the like actual DOM, right? And then test it in the same way you would test a React DOM, which is pretty damn amazing if you ask me. Okay, um, last thing we have, it's uh, just a silly thing to uh, wrap this over. Um, it is a tweet um, that I think resonates with a lot of developers. Uh, Chrome goes like, you know, we have those tons of amazing and advanced ways of debugging your JavaScript app and like maybe even Node.js app because you have the Chrome debugger as well, right? And you just go console log, exactly what I do. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> All right, that's... Um, Essentially it from my side for today, as you can hear, I'm getting cranky again. I sh think I should take some medicine again, because this cold is just killing me. I mean, <clears throat> it's been a terrible experience actually, but um, hopefully I will, yeah, thank you, thank you. I will hopefully get better uh, by it. I mean, <laughs> I hope I will get better by Saturday because if not, it's gonna be terrible. So um, the next 
podcast will happen on Saturday as usually as planned. So I get I'm going to be traveling uh, hopefully tomorrow if I'm going to be better. Uh, if not, then, you know, sometime during the week, basically for the EF stuff. I am planning to do the EF video. I don't know if I'm going to do it. I'm, I wanted to do it today, but my throat is starting to get like a bit sore. So I don't know. Um, maybe after a small break, we're going to do that. I want to talk about the EF program and startups and all that kind of stuff because it's been quite an experience. But uh, yeah, let's just stop it here. So this was BXGS Weekly, episode five. Thank you for watching and I see you next time, guys. Bye.